What's ensuing now is a, is a live interview um, with novelist Hari Kunzer. Um Hari is um, a, a British Indian novelist who was nominated by, or was awarded by um, Granta Magazine in uh, 2003. He's one of the best um, uh, British novelists under 35 or under 30? Or under 40? Under 40, yeah. Under 40, yeah. <laughs> And, um, and then soon thereafter, he published his first novel, which was called The Impressionist, and um, has a variety of sub themes that we're going to keep returning to in, in our conversation today. Um, he's since gone on to write um, uh, different novels and, and books, both of short stories and uh, essays. Um, it includes um, My Revolutions, which uh, is a sort of uh, essayistic sort of collection, um, Noise, which is a collection of earlier short stories. And uh, transmission, um, which is also has some sub themes that we're going to be returning to in, uh, in the conversation while the telephone rings in the background. Um, Hari also is a, is a, a journalist. Uh, you might have seen his work in The Guardian, where he frequently um, writes pieces on culture and literature and science fiction. Um, a recent great piece uh, uh, on a visit to Michael Moorcock, uh, the, the British science fiction writer who is now in Texas. Um, and it's also an avid user of Twitter. He's got a great uh, Twitter feed if you are on Twitter. It's just um, at Hari Kunzer. And um, lots of uh, cultural and political links uh, to to follow there. Um, so, in a nutshell, what we're going to do is um, uh, do yeah, this, like I say, this live conversation, um, and we're specifically going to focus on one aspect of the idea of assimilation, imitation, and and, and passing for something that you are not. Um, this idea of the of uh, sort of being an impressionist, as the, as the title of this first novel um, states. Um, but the idea is both to play off the fact that both Hari and I are, are huge science fiction fans and also that it's Halloween weekend. Um, and so we're putting a slight um, sort of sci-fi horror spin on this, as you'll see. But um, it's deliberately doing that in the context of the sort of socio-political and even gender and even sexuality-based notion of, of passing, of, of being recognized for something that you, that you are not and being accepted into a group that um, uh, you have, you have quote-unquote infiltrated. And so, um, I guess, yeah, I'll start with the, most, with the most basic way of opening up that topic, which is that um, I think it's fascinating that there are so many examples in the, the horror genre and also in sort of the, the dark science fiction genre of, of, uh, of a thing or a creature or, or a non-entity for that matter that comes from the periphery, it comes from the, the edges of the known, it comes from the very, the very fringes of, 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 of the, you know, the human circle. And it, and it comes to us and it acts like us. And it, um, it passes for us, and rather than being seen in a political sense as uh, having been assimilated in a positive way, this is seen as in incredibly horrifying. Um, and the, you know, the example that we emailed about was um, John Carpenter's 1982 film, The Thing, where the entire premise of the movie is that this, this thing, uh, you know, it's this abstract uh, uh, noun, um, is so perfect at replicating the scientists and so perfect at passing for basically what amounts to white scientists in Antarctica, that that in and of itself is, 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 is uh, the existential horror of the film. So I guess I want to just talk about that notion that um, passing for something that you aren't opens up a kind of um, existential void of, 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 of horror. Yeah, I think that science fiction is very good at, at, at providing quite clear metaphors for, for things like uh, uh, policing boundaries about inside and outside, and uh, especially identity-related boundaries. I mean, if you think about you know, why, why was race mixing, why is race mixing in some places and contexts still considered very, very threatening? Um, it was to do, to do with um, maintenance of clear boundaries and there's nothing more, you know, the, the, the hands in the field, the, the white lady in the, in the bedroom are kind of clearly distinct, but then once you get, once they get mixed up and you get, heaven forbid, a mixed race child, uh, then you have a, a, an, an extraordinary work in order to maintain all the kind of political and cultural uh, edifice that's erected on that, on top of that difference. Um, say, I mean, historically, you see in uh, Spanish colonies uh, initially there's a great interest in in the fact that in, in Mexico there has been some mixing and uh, and the, the sort of metropolitan elites in Mexico City and back in and back in Spain become fascinated by the you notion know, the, the of casta, of, 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 of caste, and, and um, they commission paintings um, to, to represent the difference of social strata and the different, difference of types of people that you'll find in the colonies. 
that this taxonomy becomes more and more and more complex through from, from when it sort of st first starts in the sort of early 16th century, when it's pretty much, you know, you're, you're white or you are mestizo, if you're a sort of uh, white and Indian, or you are uh, mulatto if you're if you're uh, white and black. And then is and what but what happens when somebody who's a mulatto has sex with a mestizo and then has a child? And um, so these casta taxonomies, which are as I said, there's this whole sort of genre of painting that uh, represents them, but they become more and more complex until you get you you you, you get um, I think I mean, you get up to this about 128 different uh, um, types, and, and at that point the thing pretty much breaks down. So this kind of enormous sort of neurotic work of, of, of maintaining boundaries is very important, and science fiction can um, can provide very kind of clear sites for our fantasies and our fear around that. I mean, when you when you said you wanted to talk about this, I was kind of going back through various. In mostly films, actually, and trying to kind of think about how it's changed. And you know, the classic 50s thing with um, they came from outer space is that the alien who's passing might be your neighbor. You're in the, you're in the village, everybody looks like you, but somebody might be a red under the bed. I mean, it's this kind of fear, fear of communist infiltration, is a kind of classic sort of post war, Cold War uh, trope of, of, of fears about passing and fears that the boundaries might be being kind of poorly pleased. And you know, you, you scroll that forward to, to now and there's a great kind of um, concentration on, on, on the literal border and the, and, the, and the aliens as a kind of, um, as a sort of bare life, form of bare life, these kind of abject creatures that come from outside the social space. If you look at something like District 9, that's a fantastic South African movie, where there, the aliens there are effectively the shanty, the shanty dwellers. They're the, they're in a sort of Soweto-like uh, 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 place, you know, being kept outside, outside a sort of nice, nice Cape Town with with its, uh, you know, with its privileges and its, its buildings. Or beautiful monsters. You, know, you see that? You see that one? That's, I mean, that's a, a absolutely classic kind of film about fear of fear of immigration from the southern U.S. border. They have this whole a contaminated zone and a huge, a huge border wall protecting the the safe kind of white space of the north from this from this kind of feral, uh, uh, mutated zone of horror that exists outside it. Um, another example of that, if I remember correctly, is um, the film Constantine, which um, the is a, is a pretty horrible uh, Keanu Reeves movie yeah, right. based on the comic book. But Constant, the, or, um, the the Satan figure comes into the United States by hopping the border fence between Mexico and Southern California, and infiltrate, infiltrates Los Angeles from the south and brings the forces of darkness over the border from the south. How <laughs> scary is that? I mean, you know, the flip side of the passing thing is a kind of fantasy of, of, of transgression and a fantasy of being able to be present in, in, in places that it's not possible for the white metropolitan subject to be in normally. And they, you know, um, um, Roger Kipling's Kim is a book that's always been very important to me precisely for this reason. And, you know, Kim is the... A uh, little uh, interestingly, he's not he's not English. He's he's he's, he's very specifically Irish for for, for Kipling. But there he is. He's a little white boy who who can speak Indian languages, who can who can dress in Indian clothes, and can go into the marketplace and mix it up. He can kind of become he can he can go into this alien space of of of, uh, of, of, of India in a way that other white people can't. And um, but King uses this ability to pass from one side to the other for a very noble end, which is to help uh, British political purposes in the great game, uh, the great geopolitical game against the, the Russians. And so his kind of potentially troubling uh, ability to transgress, which I think Kipling kind of hints is only possible because he's Irish and although he's white, he's a little bit dubious around the, around the edges. Um, it's, it's all nice and domesticated into the fact that it's, it's becomes a kind of tool of, of maintaining the, the empire. And in my first novel, The Impressionist, is about somebody who does who does this kind of work of passing, but doesn't uh, he doesn't have any any, any kind of nice uh, domesticated domesticated uh, goal. 
And the, the thing, I suppose, in contemporary culture that strikes me as most, most similar to, to Kim is the film Avatar, um, where you have this, um, you know, there he is, he's, 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 a, he's, a, he's a cripple, he's a, he's a wounded man, he's in a, he's in a wheelchair, his body is not functioning properly, and he is able to go and inhabit not just a, a functioning body, but this extraordinary uh, alien alien body that will take him into into a kind of uh, a culture that has this necessary organic relationship with the with the planet that it comes from that has this uh, this sort of uh, is this sort of fantasy of it's kind of the green green fascist fantasy of of of, uh, of this this forest the noble savage forest culture and which you know which he as the as the the, the, sort of the white guy gets to gets to play, and you know, and he, he becomes their leader, and he he has sex with the princess as, as well. The whole, you know, the whole nine yards. He gets to do the, he gets uh, he gets the whole uh, lot, and um, but it's a troubled fantasy, of course, because he's a representative there of a, of a mining company that wants to wants to sort of strip mine the the forest for for raw materials, and he has to make this kind of uh, ethical. Decision about which side he's on. Is he going to go native? Is he? Uh, you know, is, and which is, and there the going native is the other thing about passing that is always, uh, it's always the terror, the terror that kind of exists at the horizon of passing is if you get too good at, 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 at pretending to be this other thing, when do you actually become it? When do you cease to have your uh, your safe uh, white space to come back to? Um, well, yeah, I think it's, it's it's interesting that in, in the Avatar example that they, the idea that the, 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 the white can the white man can go from the center to the periphery and act like the periphery and be accepted and that's a heroic narrative of mm. experiencing the other and opening oneself to multicultural experience, whereas the opposite is seen as this uh, viral in, in, in infection of the, of the of the of the central host where something is breaking down the the the, the guard and, and entering uh, without invitation into um, a place where now being found out can result in violence and, and even murder. And I mean, for instance, one of the subplots of a of a of a of a, of a, of a, of a it seems increasingly popular television show called Sons of Anarchy is that one of the one of the minor characters finds out that he's actually half black, and the entire subplot now is him trying to protect that knowledge from his motorcycle club mates because he knows that it will result in him being kicked out and potentially even killed, or at the very least violently, you know, injured for for passing as white. Because it is, yeah, he's he's um, Italian American, but it turns out he's actually you know half half. <laughs> so it's a the the very fact that that's considered yeah this 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 source of um, uh, 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 violation of the of the of the norms of interaction that you know you didn't tell us that you were you were half something else or that you were you were something else and you're acting like us and that's visibility is really really important in all in in all this in the American literature about passing. You know, I mean, you, you know, you think of things like Invisible Man, and he's, you know, he's there. He is. He's trying to be seen and be seen for who he is. But then there are all these sort of other, other, other books, and then the last one's Passing, or Autobiography of an Ex-Coloured Man. And the the troubling thing is that one isn't visible as oneself. One is one is one is masquerading as something else, and the deception is is potentially punishable. Um, but it kind of has a kind of uh, Psychological risk to it, you know, shame and, 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 and guilt and, and, and so on. Um, the, I'm also interested in the sort of the infinitely malleable subject position, and um, you've got a, a, a brief uh, line or description in um, I think it's transmission where you're referring to um, working in a call center in India, and that it's the you knowing what accent to put on based on what time of day, because then you know you're getting phone calls from the eastern United States, you're getting phone calls from. England, or you're getting phone calls from Australia, and you know, knowing, okay, uh, now's the time of day that I need to sound Australian because I'm in a call center, and you know, I'm in the infinitely flexible position. And, and, and I mean, that's that's kind of great sort of example of, of, of bad faith, uh, you know, creeping into people's daily lives. Is my my dad's great game whenever he's he's um, he's he's phoning up a call center just to try and get them to answer the question that they never want to answer, which is where are you? Everybody, everybody who is actually in an outsourcing centre in, 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 in Delhi or Bangalore is, is sort of the first thing you must, must, must never reveal is that how far you're, how far away you are. I mean, they, you know, you may have seen film of, of the training sessions that 
the call centre operatives have to have. They're given alternative names. You know, they're given uh, this morning morning training on the kind of the day's small talk kind of topics. You know, didn't the didn't the Open Raiders do great? Um, and and you know, obviously the sort of accent training and so on and so forth. But at a certain point, uh, you know, my my dad's Indian, and, and, and he you know, he can usually sort of leave her open the point to what them to the point where maybe even they'll start talking Hindi to him and then actually stop very quickly because I think that's a sort of firing uh, offence in some places. <laughs> um, well that leads to, um, you gave a great talk recently, I think it was actually in Brooklyn appropriately, which was about the figure of the hipster and um, one of the things that was really interesting was that uh, in your description of what a hipster is culturally is, 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 is effectively the subject that cannot commit. Um, uh, which is the academic way of saying that it's someone who will never have just one interest and pin himself down to one particular thing. You know, whereas 15 years ago, maybe you'd have a mohawk and you'd be uh, self-identified as a, as a metalhead or as a punk rock uh, fan. Now you can just be this sort of infinitely open, uh, you can have, uh, uh, you can signify anything as a hipster. And so therefore it's this kind of, um, or I, I guess my question is, is do you see the hipster in either positive or negative terms as a attempt to almost go avatar on the world and um, I, I, I incorporate or take on identities that can be shed whenever it's appropriate. And you can go from listening to 80s hair bands to deer hunter in a, in a click of an eye, but you're still a hipster. And I'm just curious like, how, how that plays into this idea of assimilation and passing. Yeah. I mean, the hipster is essentially a tragic figure. The hipster kills what he loves um, by, by um, by taking it on, and, and it's interesting. This is, I think this, this is the first sort of true the post-internet mutation of youth culture. And I grew up in a really kind of tribal kind of youth cultural context in in in, uh, in London in the in the nineteen eighties. It was absolutely about that. It was about authenticity. It was about committing to be a mod or a punk or whatever it was. You were against the odds, and then you, you get that in the lyrics room. From sort of songs of the of the period and the place, you know about you know, uh, you know mod for life. It'll never be over for me. You know, I'll keep the faith. All this kind of uh, this sort of uh, persistence uh, stuff. But there, you know, but that was also predicated on the fact that <coughs> cultural signifiers were very very hard to come by. You had to work extremely hard to get the clothes, to find the music, to you know to actually assemble your your kind of uh, panoply of, of stuff to identify yourself with. Um, I mean, I, I remember reading about how it was uh, in the 1950s in Britain if you wanted to find a pair of blue jeans, if you wanted to identify yourself as a, as a teddy boy or a, or a rocker. I mean, you're basically having to go and find an American sailor at a port and could do bartering to find you to, to, to get a pair of blue jeans. So if you saw somebody on the street with a pair of jeans on, you knew that person was really, really committed to all the things that that meant. And now in the in the, the internet age, we can pretty much kind of pick up a set of a set of symbols or find the esoteric information very, very easy. So the barriers to entry are so very low. The I and mean, hipsterness is almost it's almost a sort of state of, of it's a sort of self positioning in relation to the mainstream and in relation to you know, where to to the, to the new uh, and and it's and it's 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 this kind of it's a sort of surfing you are at a certain point you're always going to ultimately fall back and, and fail and either things have been kind of become uh, uh, mass signifiers in some way or they'll become. Uh, commodified or in some way in order to maintain your pose of difference you'll have to you'll have to move off from hence this kind of um, much mocked tendency of the, the hipster to reinvent because it's kind of the signifiers run out of juice really quickly so unless you have this week's this week's gang hand signal to flash to your to your fellow you won't know who are the real hipsters and who are the who are the who are the ones you don't want to be hanging out with you know and, this, and there's a kind of terror about that, I think it's become extremely neurotic. I mean, it was was kind of there was always something quite neurotic about youth cultural belonging. I mean, the kind of angst I used to have about it was just we, we had very early like um, sneaker wars where I grew up. And people were getting kind of robbed for their Deodora gold tennis shoes and things like that. But there was always this sort of anxiousness about display, and and um, it's not. But now it's become. It's 
become constant and impossible. You only kind of fall off. You fall off it by some sort of act of uh, of surrender or, or, or failure, and then you're you know you're doomed to go and live in the suburbs and reproduce <laughs> with, with, with um, generic clothes. You can, you can imagine a situation where someone gets sick for a week, and then when they when they get off their their sick bed and go out into public, they're yeah, one, do, one week behind in the hipster and never yeah, ever ever, ever catch up. up. So it's the LCD sound system thing. I'm losing my edge. The kids are coming up from behind. That's why that song was so, yeah. so great. Let's open it. Oh, it's it's it's, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's interesting in that in that context, just anecdotally. That I feel like um, the the most recent William Gibson novel. I think in, in fact, I could the most uh, recent novels that he's been writing seem to be this almost cargo cult like attempt to bring back valor or uh, attraction to the, to the notion of shopping and the notion of this authentic object, because you mentioned the genes and the, uh, effectively the entire sort of opening plotline of um, the most recent book, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but Zero, zero History. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is that Zero History is uh, looking for this one particular pair of genes, isn't, it, isn't that basically yeah. the idea of the plot? Yeah. That are, yeah, that are, that are so rare that they have to be tracked down internationally and, and it's, and it just, it's, it's the idea that it doesn't appear really to be that ironic actually, but the, the, he's he's actually he is actually so also a denim fetishist because he kind of talks about it on the on Twitter sometimes, and and I think for years he's had some kind of fascination with the Japanese reproductions of you know salvage denim. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's ironic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm curious about just kind of spatializing this a little bit and talking about where these sorts of things take place. And um, you know, another thing that we were uh, uh, just communicating about briefly um, in, in the setup for the conversation today was um, there's a we're basically like the spaces of encounter, the cities, the, the environments, the, the locations where these kinds of overlaps and infiltrations and uh, moments of passing and and impressionism, so to speak, can, can occur. Um, and so, just to go back to the horror idea, one of the things that, that I, I mentioned was that um, Ian Sinclair, has, who's an English writer, has uh, this uh, interestingly flippant take on Dracula, which is that Dracula was the basically the first person to take advantage of modern uh, uh, real estate agents to move from Europe to downtown London, and by, by way of, of uh, sea passage to Whitby, down to a series of apartments and luxury places to live in, in London. And so, um, what's interesting about that then is that this vampiric figure comes into the city, uh, you know, moves through complex real estate negotiations, and instantly now can be a sort of socio-political metaphor for the what the gentrifier, the someone who comes in and sort of sucks the blood of the, of the people in the neighborhood, um, and and uses these sorts of things to their own advantage. But so, in any case, I guess I'm curious about not only that specific kind of vampiric notion of of property moving through the city, but the locations where these things occur, you know, Avatar is off-world on a jungle planet, um, but in other places it's, you know, the bar on the corner in, in East London, or it's out on the street in the case of the riots, or in the case of Occupy Wall Street, etc. So where, 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 how does this spatialize, what does that do to, to the interaction itself? I mean, I suppose, yeah, I mean, you're, you're traditionally looking at kind of ports of entry, aren't you? I mean, yeah, as you said, Dracula comes in to Whitby, and he comes in in a ship full of soil. He needs his native uh, native soil and his, his, his coffins there, which is quite interesting, the kind of, the, the sort of oddity of having the, the portable, uh, the portable um, a blood and soil kind of uh, uh, thing happening. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, people, people tend, tend to have these fantasies. These, these are city, city experiences. The, the, the experience of passing is possible in the, in the, in the city. Um, historically, um, world cities have, have kind of been where people have been able to reinvent themselves. The, you know, after, I mean, there was a huge Anglo Indian community. Example in the, that grew up during the, the time of the British Empire in India of people who were by and large the offspring of white men and native women rather than the other way round. And um, after the mutiny, after the revolution, the Northern Tefal Revolution in 1857, um, the British government lost uh, lost trust in a lot of uh, of, of, of Indian. Uh, servants and were very was very nervous about putting certain bits of infrastructure into the hands of uh, uh, of Indians, uh, specifically things like the post, the postal service, the railways, and so on. And these became the preserve of this mixed race uh, 
community which um, prided itself in, 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 in its uh, closeness to whiteness and had a, a very kind of troubled relationship with uh, um, a very a relationship sort of guilt and shame about, about its Indian blood and that when 1947 came along um, these former imperial servants suddenly found this whole kind of class of people had no further um, place in the new nationalist independent India so a lot of them came to, to, to Britain and, and other places and on the voyage on the way just conveniently lost that whole narrative about themselves and came into British cities uh, and passed as, as white if it was possible. A friend of mine who's 50 years old now was just, his mother just confessed to him that actually, you know, that his, uh, his one of his grandparents had been Indian and this was this terrible secret that they kept throughout this whole uh, childhood in Liverpool, uh, and that he's you know so he's now trying to kind of work out if that's been, if that means anything at all. If that's it, does that make any difference to his life whatsoever? Um, so yeah, I mean, so so sort of passing yeah, it's, it's it's an urban thing. It's it's the, that kind of anxiety about the city that that commentators, conservative commentators, have often had. You know, sort of since since urban life started becoming a kind of major. Uh, major and object of contemplation in the 17th, 18th century. There was a sort of nervousness that, that traditional sort of spatial hierarchies would be disrupted by the, the jumble of, of, of urban life. I mean, you, know, you think about the, the subway carriage in, in New York or London or wherever, and you think about the kind of the, the democratic, the democracy of strap hanging, which you know, I find there's a reason that I'm, I would be in a place like this, and is, is it precisely what, what terrified the the taxonomizers and the people who are invested in, in um, separating these these uh, difference spatially in that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other, and the other the other sort of spatial thing which you know, needs to be classified is the border in in all its different manifestations and um, you know the fact that of a, uh, a white and non-white person having sex and having a child is is a kind of, sort of permanent border border crossing that can't kind of really be undone. Um, and um, did you see the Republican debate the other night when they had that kind of crazy competitive architectural sure. moment about the fence? I um, like, I mean, Perry, who's obviously got to, has had historically to answer lots of border-related questions because he's, he's from Texas, he said, you know, would you fence the entire southern border of the US? And he said, it will cost $30 billion and take 10 years and probably wouldn't work and starts talking about aerial surveillance and all the other things you could do to secure the border that are not just a fence. Well, Michel Black went straight in, I've got a fence, and it'd be a double fence, and there'll be a space in between the fence. She starts basically describing the thing that she would build in a really sort of weirdly specific way, like she's got this kind of slightly sort of stomach luft um, you know, guard towers kind of thing that she was that she was going on. So the, um, I mean, she's completely misunderstood what the border means now because the border is in the in in the process of of, of virtualizing it itself. I mean, you can be in New York and you can be on the wrong side of the border if you're if you're undocumented, and with various sorts of ability to track people through space using information technology and, and, and other and other sort of related technologies. I think the kind of the business of, of, of the I mean they'll be the first line of spatial segregation to keep them south of the border. But then but then the border is now everywhere. The border is everywhere where you can, you know it's in, in every kitchen and every every kind of you know hotel basement in this in this city. So the, that's uh, that's a kind of complication of the notion of the body could be occupying the same physical space, but there could be, in some ways, you know, there are, are info-related borders, depending on what kind of uh, metadata about the people in the space is, you know, how you're tagged, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the, um, your forthcoming novel, Gods and Men, which, or excuse me, Gods Without Men, which comes out in, in the US in what, March? Is that when it comes out? So it's already out in England. Um, but where it's, it's, a, it's it from, what I have read of the, of the novel, I, I, as, as you know, I haven't, I haven't read it yet, but 
that is the idea of uh, the American West and the desert landscape and being a totally different type of, of alien encounter. In, in fact, literally, literal ufology in the case of, of, yeah. of one of the plot lines of the book. I mean, as it turned out, I mean, I, I, uh, I came to the States to do a fellowship with the New York Public Library intending to use the uh, Asian collection there to, to write a book that was actually set in 16th century India, and that kind of fell apart in my hands, partly through, um, partly, partly through, I just sort of completely underestimated how, how the experience of living in a new country would affect me and affect what I wanted to write about, and just, just affect how I how I was doing this. So I ended up quite randomly going on a road trip to Joshua Tree uh, with, some, with some friends and became kind of increasingly fascinated by this, um, uh, this sort of waste landscape of Eastern California and Nevada. And I mean, I had some, I, I'd known a little bit about the Center for Land Use Interpretation and, and, and some of their sort of research is in, in these kind of forgotten or uh, Neglected, or in other words, sort of low-status kinds of land use. But it, 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 the more I looked at that area, the more interesting it became to me. Partly because of the overlap of, um, as you know, so much of it is military land, and then so much of it is is, is uh, inaccessible because it's bombing ranges, or it's uh, missile testing, or it's uh, air force air bases or marine bases, and also because historically that Great Basin was the last barrier to westward migration. Uh, for um, pioneers in the 19th century, you know, you were know, either going by ship to San Francisco or you were heading across this this vast emptiness in order to get to the, the promised land of, of coastal California, and and that that kind of legacy, uh, and, 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 the, and nowadays it's a place where you go and if, if somehow you're, you're sort of not really dealing very well with being in close proximity to other people, I mean there are a lot of people out there I kind of ran into who don't like having neighbours because they're cooking meth or they're, uh, they're um, and, you know, they have some sort of religious notion that they need to work through. That the um, and so there's, there's this kind of and and, what, and as you you brought up your ufology, um, I you know I had kind of realised that in early UFO culture really kind of was was born out of that landscape but hadn't kind of understood all the components in it, it, it became increasingly interesting to me that it was this sort of, uh, there's the aerospace industry and then there is a long, um, sort of largely I suppose Protestant history of a kind of um, a, the, the lone seeker after truth, uh, have a, attempting to kind of commune directly with God and solve and solve uh, uh, spiritual problems without without kind of agency of an established church or anything like that. And I I discovered that uh, really a lot of those first generation of UFO contactees, the people in the late forties and, and early fifties, were people who had already been involved in spiritualism and the kind of tradition of uh, uh, the mystical tradition that kind of comes out of the Golden Dawn in the nineteenth century, Madame Blavatsky, W. B. Yeats, all this kind of um, this. Uh, and that had a huge uh, uplift after the First World War with people trying to contact the, their dead relatives uh, you know, from the, the, the war dead and uh, through seances. So there was this kind of, there was this sort of spiritual notion of a kind of benevolent force, a higher force, a kind of pantheistic force that was often conceptualized as being kind of a union of Eastern and Western spirituality. And then somehow, uh, in the face, I think, largely of, of uh, atomic weapons and the fear of, of destruction that, um, the, uh, of, of nuclear weapons, a kind of whole new scientific discourse got bolted on to this pre-existing um, spiritualist discourse. So you get so the first um, alien contacts are never ever with the the, the greys, the kind of classics of bug-eyed uh, aliens that, that we we know now. That they were always with. Uh, Nordic-looking, higher, uh, or higher-order humans. They're like us, only better. And you know, there's endless sort of tunics and and, and sort of uh, and, and blonde hair and, and, and this kind of, and um, uh, a kind of, a kind of sort of awe. And there's a perfected version of us. And the narrative is, is very often that 
uh, we the aliens have been looking uh, looking down on you for a very long time and now we need to make ourselves known because you've suddenly got this new technology and you're risking uh, destroying yourselves and so now this is the moment when we will have to intervene in human history to to, uh, to stop you destroying yourselves. I mean, there's one guy I got fascinated by this guy, George Van Tassel, who had been an aircraft engineer, so he was in Burbank. Uh, and uh, left left his job and took his family to live uh, in a hollowed out uh, cave, which is uh, uh, under the world's largest freestanding boulder in a place called uh, Landers, California, and it's the most intimately called Giant Rock. And um, in 1947, Van Tassel had a contact experience. He was sleeping outside his his large rock. And, uh, the Venusians came down, and there was a man and a woman, and they were very beautiful. And uh, they gave him the spiel about about uh, nuclear weapons and uh, and transcending divisions in the Cold War. And they put in that our big problem with this new technology was that we don't we, we are we are foolish and young, and, they are, and and only if we were to live longer would we develop the wisdom that we need to, to, to handle this stuff. And so they gave him the secret of life extension, which was nice. And uh, he, he, they gave him the plans about how to build a life extension machine. And he uh, then went on a college lecture tour, actually, so they took it for the, for the, <laughs> through trying to raise money and interest in this and started, and started holding these UFO contactee conferences out in the, in the desert at the Giant Rock. You know, all through the 50s he's doing this, and they got up to about 10,000 people coming there to swap experiences and, and you know, all, all the things that one, one does at a, at a fair like that. And finally he got to build this thing called, which is called the Integratron. Um, and it's like a, it's still there. It's, a, it's like a little wooden observatory. It's very important that it had been all wood construction. There's no metal nails or any other metal used in it. Uh, and the top, this is a domed thing, the top floor is supposed to spin around a central electromagnetic coil and an electrical potential would be generated between top and, uh, top and bottom and I forget which way around it is, either, part, you're either if you, you go in downstairs and your bay is either in positive or negative ions and this will do cell repair and will live to 150 and be able to deal with uh, uh, nuclear, nuclear weapons and of course uh, there it is, he built the thing, just about to switch it on when he dies of a heart attack. And uh, the mysterious men in black then came and took the plans and they took his electronics. And uh, there's, a, there's a whole sort of paranoid narrative about, uh, about what could have been and what, and what never was. And uh, the, the structure sort of decayed and was briefly reopened as a disco in the 1980s. Uh, and, and then was bought by these three hippie sisters from LA who now run it as a meditation retreat. So if you are in the Joshua Tree area, you can go and get a sound bath at the Integral Tree, which is very good. I don't know if I'm going to live for longer. But hopefully we'll see you in another century. Uh, <laughs> come back and, and, and speak. Um, well, I think in, in the interest of time, if there's, a, if there's a one more question, and then we can, we can wrap up. And, um, is there a funny wrap bag of stuff we talked about? I have a question about, uh, uh, about uh, writing in cyberspace, as it were. Uh, I, I think you know you started out writing for Wired back before there was, I mean, there was an internet, but not very many people were on it. And then you know the transmission sort of takes you know place in the cyber world, and I'm curious about you know. Uh, that as a space in which narrative can take place, and also because it's changing so fast, sort of the, the geography or the boundaries of it, how you navigate it. Yeah, um, there's a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I got interested in the net in the very the early 90s, into the 91, 92, and uh, I remember when there was fewer than a thousand websites in the whole world. <laughs> um, but a cyberspace is a space for narrative. I mean, there's this whole thing about shouldn't you? Know, and for years, I was thinking, well, why am I interested in this linear, novelistic narrative? Surely, I should be doing a kind of choose your own adventure, multi-dimensional uh, sort of cyber fiction. There was all sorts of people around who were making experiments of that kind, and 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 I had 
And there was something so essentially so unsatisfying about it structurally. And actually now, these days, now I think that, that whole area has been colonized by games and those are the pleasures that are of, 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 of finding your way through a, a space are, are, are largely being delivered by, by the games games world. But the, uh, you know, so this, 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 I mean, it's something we can like, play on about that to do with linearity and to do with, to do with um, sort of the author. Um, but as a, as a place for fiction, it surprises me that there's not more more writing that, that uses that culture as a, as a backdrop. I mean, I think it is so endlessly fascinating. It has a set, has a set of uh, social rules and interests that you know, are thoroughly worthy of novelistic exploration. And, um, you know, I've never had any geek status at all. I, you know, I'm pretty much enumerate and, uh, and you know, I was always a sort of observer. As a, the wide job I had in the sort of early mid nineties meant that I could get and go and meet a lot of these engineers and so on, and kind of try and try and understand how they thought and and and, and the kind of things that were interesting to them, and the ideas that were, were touched on in the last presentation about things like emergence and people like Stuart Kaufman would would, uh, would come up as as uh, you know new ways of, of, of generating form and, and, and an understanding how how uh, form comes about. Um, but yeah, I did, uh, so yeah, it's, it's an endless mystery to me that people are still writing these kind of tedious sagas about uh, couples breaking up in, in thoroughly unwired contexts in Brooklyn, but than writing more, more kind of geek novels. I mean, so yeah, so, yeah so, I mean, the whole area has been ceded to people like China and, and has been ceded to the science fiction uh, context. Oh, well, cool. Thank you very much, sir. Nice having you.